Okay, shall we shall we start? Yes. Good. Uh, my name is Leo Shin. Um, I'm a faculty member in History and Asian Studies, and I'm also the convener of the Hong Kong Studies Initiative at UBC. Um, very glad that there's no strike. Everybody is here. Um, and so, as you know, as perhaps some of you know, we have quite a few events on campus um, this semester uh, about Hong Kong. Um, as I guess we all know that lots of lots are happening in, in Hong Kong. And when we first started sort of putting together the program for this semester, we were thinking about really looking back at the umbrella movement. Um, we thought that it would be a good idea after five years to um, take some time to reflect on uh, what happened five years ago and how Hong Kong has evolved since then. Uh, of course, little did we know when we started thinking about putting together the various programs for this term that things would take a very different turn uh, in the last few months. So, so, but at the same time, I thought that it's still a good idea because what we do here, what we do on campus, is to try to be more reflective, right? Try to to not necessarily react to things happening on the ground right away, but to take a step back and to think about um, some larger implications. I'm a historian by training. Dr. Wong is a, tra is a historian by training. We think that the world would be a better place if there are more historians. <laughs> um, so, um, so anyway, so this, so this, the talk today uh, by Professor Wong is really to also to offer a more his a historical perspective on, on, on so what is happening in Hong Kong from a more historical perspective. But I also want to point out, um, mention to you that there are two events, um, well, there are many events coming up in the next two weeks, but in particular, I want to draw your attention to a very special event this Saturday. Um, we have uh, one of the projects that um, my colleagues and I are doing is to collect some oral histories. Um, we interviewed uh, 10 people, community members, who had experiences, who had experienced uh, with the umbrella, umbrella movement, whether actually was there on the ground or was obviously in, or in Vancouver uh, watching carefully back then. So we, we interviewed 10, uh, 10 community members and we video recorded those interviews. And um, what we're trying to do is, that's one of the things that historians do, we value very much original sources, right? Uh, First-hand testimony. Um, so what we did was we interviewed them, we put their transcript, and we put them up. And eventually, you'll be a, a database. Um, you can access the website, you can access our uh, videos, and basically to, to, to get a sense of how 10 different people, how they, five years hands, how they reflected on their, their experiences, um, what they were thinking, and how they are thinking about uh, the umbrella movement from the twi from sort of 2019 perspective. Uh, so what we're going to do on Saturday, uh, we brought in some, we'll, we'll be bringing in uh, some of those interviewees. Uh, they'll have a sharing session. We'll, we'll show uh, some video clips of their interviews. So that's one part. Another part of that day's event is um, we have also invited a, an artist, a local artist, Vancouver-based artist, who happened to be living in Hong Kong at that time. And, um, and during that, during that, during 2014, um, she produced one artwork for each day of the protest. And so um, she's going to bring her artwork here. She's going to display them in the lobby. And she'll also give an artist talk as well. So it will be a very interesting event on Saturday. So if you have time, if the buses are still running, um, Saturday, uh, starting at 1 p.m. So that would be good. And also, um, then the next weekend, 12, uh, December 7th, we are going to show, um, there, there are many documentaries produced on the Umbrella Movement since 2014. Um, they are good in different ways, um, but this one is particularly well known. Um, so we are going to show it. We are going to show it, we are going to do it at the uh, Freddie Wood Theatre. Um, and it's free, it's open. Um, so uh, again, if you have time, you are welcome to come. And we are also going to beam, beam. Star Trek. We're going to beam the, the director in. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to 
try to do a Skype interview with him after the screening. So it'll be 9 a.m. Sunday time, Singapore time. Uh, so he's going to wake up for us. Let's hope he's going to wake up for us. <laughs> so, so that's so things. Lots of things are happening. So um, let's get back to today's business. So we have um, so Dr. John Wong's is okay. I'll leave it there. So very brief introduction of um, Professor Wong. Um, a, Professor Wong has a very interesting training. Um, he's a historian, but he's also um, he had training in economics and business, MBA. We can say that he had an MBA. He has an MBA, um, but he saw the lights. <laughs> and so, so, so there we go. And Professor Wong has been teaching at the University of Hong Kong since 20, uh, 2012. He has been with the Hong Kong Studies program there, but he's also moving on to a joint appointment with the Institute of Humanities and Social Science. Professor okay. um, Wong has a very interesting dynamic research profile. He's interested in, perhaps from his background, you can guess he's interested in business history, uh, but not the dry kind of business history. Is there any other? <laughs> but in a sense of the, Basically, right, think about it is, is the flow of goods, the flow of obviously money, the flow of ideas, the flow of people. Um, flow, right? Flow has been a very important part of that, that research and, and, and interest. And um, his first book was on a 19th century Cantonese trader. Um, we tend to have a very limited view on what Cantonese trade in the 19th century. We think about opium war, we think about, right? tea trade, um, but the book is very interesting. It's really about the global connections of this Cantonese trader in the 19th century. So again, putting Chinese history uh, in a more broader global perspective um, is not a recent phenomenon. It's not a 20th century phenomenon, not a 21st century phenomenon, but you know, China has always been connected to the world. And, and of course, one of the distinctive part of South China and Hong Kong is that it has been open to the world for the longest time, all the way back to the Tang Dynasty. So anyway, um, I will just keep my uh, um, uh, uh, remarks short. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Wong. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you for your very really kind words and a very generous uh, introduction. Um, I, I guess I should start by thanking you, not just for this opportunity to speak to the crowd, but for the great program that you're running here at UBC. Um, the Hong Kong Studies Initiatives. What I, what I uh, find uh, interesting is that we are starting to get quite a few centers of Hong Kong Studies on a global scale. Um, here, of course, Hong Kong, we have a few uh, programs and in the UK as well. And that's a great way for us to not just connect, get connected as academics and not just get connected because we need to petition the various governments to, to help us out in Hong Kong. But then there is, uh, I think, starting to be a little bit more of an inward-looking tendency in Hong Kong in certain quarters and what better way to get us connected than to come to Vancouver, where you have not just the academic connections that we have built, but also the historical, the cultural connections between the city and Hong Kong. So thank you very much, and um, you and your team, for having um, started that in uh, UBC uh, for the last few years. Now today, the topic is prosperity and stability. Why did Hong Kong work? I guess you can say that the title itself um, is insinuating that something is not working. <laughs> which is actually my intention. Uh, we, we do have some pr pretty pressing issues in Hong Kong right now. The city is burning, literally. Maybe not as much in the last few days, but it has been burning for a little while. And as a historian, I'm not supposed to be too presentist. I'm not supposed to project today's categories in uh, the past and try to make sense of the situation. But it's precisely because of that that I've chosen to look back at a certain period in Hong Kong to see how things worked in that period and how the various forces have evolved to today's situation where things don't seem to be quite clicking. Um, and hopefully that will give us some clues to um, how, how we can resolve the crisis of um, today's Hong Kong. Um, Leo talked to you about my background, uh, business, history, so you can forgive me for being a little bit, a little bit materialistic in my focus. But I will also submit for your consideration that it's not just me. That is, that was, that is, many in Hong Kong's preoccupation. We, we, have, we have a lot of uh, concerns about socioeconomic uh, factors in Hong Kong. And maybe by focusing on that, we can retrieve some of the story 
uh, from the last few decades and how that might have evolved. Now it's a moment of crisis. Rome was not built in a day and we didn't lose faith in our government in Hong Kong just overnight. What I'm proposing to do is that we'll examine the current crisis beyond the protesters' political demands. <clears throat> and in so doing, explore how socioeconomic forces might have fueled today's movement. <clears throat> what we're going to do in the next little bit is to see how socioeconomic factors provided key ingredients for the colonial government to structure a certain narrative that legitimized its rule in Hong Kong, of course, as we're talking about the British colonial government, and how these factors might have unraveled and splintered the demography in Hong Kong and creating some of the crises uh, that we are seeing today. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer first. I'm going to explore socioeconomic forces underpinning the discontent of Hong Kongers, but that does not mean that I'm denying the legitimacy of the political demands. The political demands in the current turmoil underscores the erosion of Hong Kongers' faith in the administration and demanding unease in the Hong Kong-Beijing relationship. So what I explore here is but the material dimension of that deteriorating relationship. So we're talking about the history of the recent past. And in here, I think you have to indulge me a little bit. I can see certain faces here that might have lived through that period as well. This is certainly a period of history that um, is part of my upbringing. And just out of curiosity, when you look at the, uh, the title, the, in quotes, prosperity and stability, how many of you actually say, oh, I know what you're talking about? Some, okay. Uh, thank you for, for telling me your age. Uh, we're in the same <laughs> bracket, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. What we are talking about here is the construction of a certain golden era in Hong Kong's history that started primarily in the late 70s, moved into the 80s, and a certain part of the 90s. And what I have here um, is actually a uh, Picture that I, I didn't choose for the purpose that people seem to be inferring now, fireworks. Uh, some friends of mine noticed that, uh, well, noticed, noticed the, the advertisement on Facebook for this talk in Hong Kong, and they said, oh wow, you, you, you're so clever, you, you, are, you have fireworks to celebrate the, uh, the election on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how, how, much, how much you're following the, the situation there, but the anti-Beijing camp uh, unseated uh, their opponents in many of the district council seats. Uh, and that's certainly cause for celebration, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, if that's the case, then it's all Leo's foresight, not, not mine. <laughs> uh, but to be honest, though, why are we talking about fireworks when you're talking about prosperity and stability, except for, I don't know, the usual connection? Anyone knows the, uh, the history of fireworks in Hong Kong? It was, uh, it was quite, um, quite a decision for the government to cancel fireworks on... Um, the anniversary of the handover this year, because this is this is a ritualistic celebration of things that are going great just by in Hong Kong. We we tend to think of it as uh, something that comes from a time immemorial, but it didn't. It actually started in the early 80s. As a matter of fact, the first fireworks was in 1982, reportedly uh, celebrating the 150th um, anniversary of the founding of Jackie Matheson, who was living home in Hong Kong. But and think about the time frame. That was also a period of huge uncertainty over the future of Hong Kong. The Joint Declaration was not signed until 1984. We had started talking about uh, what's going to happen in Hong Kong post-97 in the late 70s, early 80s. So fireworks here was associated with um, a move to shore up the confidence in Hong Kong that things are still hunky-dory. Uh, and look, to, the, to this very day, you have New Year's, uh, Chinese New Year's fireworks to dress up the city, to project a sense of prosperity. Hence my focus on a certain narrative of this, of this particular period. Well, we have moved on to uh, different types of fireworks. Um, this one here is actually not, even, so the, the, the one to your left is from the 1980s, the one to your right, I'm not even updating you to the current moment, this is actually just from the Umbrella Movement. Mm. So five years ago, uh, looks bad enough, but if you've been following Hong Kong the news, um, things are getting even more spectacular in a way. So how far back do I plan to take you today? Well, the current moment of turmoil crisis, 
um, violence in Hong Kong is probably something that we've not seen since the riots of the 60, 1966 and 67. What I would propose that we do is to look at the way the British colonial government, the way in which the British colonial government uh, proceeded to improve, or at least to tell you they're improving the social economic situation in Hong Kong, regains, in, and in doing so, regain a certain footing in the colony. I guess we have to remember that a political regime derives its legitimacy not necessarily from democratic election. As a matter of fact, in the aftermath of the previous round of turmoil, the late 60s, the British colonial government regained legitimacy of its rule largely through the socioeconomic improvement of its colonies. So in other words, I'm asking us to consider why a previous generation of Hong Kongers actually acquiesce to the British rule of the colony of that particular period. Now here, I, I should insert another disclaimer. In no way am I, tell, am I saying that Hong Kong did not enjoy democracy in the, in the 70s and 80s and uh, yet was fine, so we don't deserve democracy. No, that's not my point. Instead, as I explore how the British colonial government constructed the narrative in a bid to secure its regime, we seek to understand how this historical process might have resulted in socioeconomic forces that might be animating differently the various demographic groups in Hong Kong. And then we can proceed to question whether political reforms alone could put an end to the conflicts in Hong Kong today. Now, by extending the timeline of analysis from today's crisis all the way back to the late six, mid to late 60s, uh, we'll, we'll touch on a few uh, turning points and uh, they will become interesting and, uh, as, our, as part of our discussions. We'll certainly be looking at the period of 1970s, 1980s, the post-riot period, through the period of Sino-British negotiations. The conclusion thereof, as we march into 1989, June 4th, in the post handover period, the difficult times of 2003, and then the umbrella movement and today's environment. So let me give you the context. 1966-67, but this is a, just a tad before my time, so I do have to refer to my notes to get the figures right. <laughs> so 1966, a five cent increase in the first class fare for the Star Ferry sparked off riots that resulted in 59 deaths. 443 injuries, and 1,740 convictions. That proved to be just the beginning, because in 1967, there was another um, situation, labor dispute, um, that resulted in what came to be an eight-month struggle, in which 51 people died, over 800 injured, and some 2,000 convictions. What was spectacular of that period, which um, you see here in black and white photos, was that um, there, there, were, there was reportedly 1,200 bomb incidents, 253 uncontrolled explosions, and over 8,000 suspected bombs dealt with by the bomb disposal teams. Of the 51 that I told you uh, who died, 15 of them died from bomb attacks. So you have, you have um, from that period, many people getting, um, getting jailed, getting convicted, and as a matter of fact, today you can still go to uh, what was the detention, detention center in Mount Davis, um, where another North American institution has erected a campus um, at the tip of the Hong Kong Island. Why are we talking about this particular episode? Well, this was an interesting episode. Some interpret it as a spillover from the Cultural Revolution in the mainland. Uh, that only ended in Hong Kong because Zhou Enlai uh, had sufficient power to call it off. But at the height of it, the British actually had planned for an emergency evacuation, not just of its own personnel, British personnel, but also Chinese people working under the regime. In the end though, the British did not need to realize those contingency plans. And ironically, it was the left wing, the pro-Beijing group, in Hong Kong that suffered a heavy defeat. They suffered a heavy defeat not because they failed to unseat the colonial government, but because they developed an image, a very negative image, that was tarnished by the bomb attacks. So here's the irony 
If you have a pro Beijing regime that was trying to uh, cause some trouble in Hong Kong for the uh, for the colonial government, but the colonial government was the one that emerged the winner in this situation. So the, in the aftermath of the 60s, uh, riot, the rise in the 60s, the government at that time, David Trench and uh, Mary McLehose, who inaugurated what has um, uh, come to be known as the Golden Era of Hong Kong, inaugurated a lot of social reforms. It was from that period that um, actually Leo and I were the first generation of um, free education system in Hong Kong, free and compulsory education system in Hong Kong. In 1972, the government also introduced a 10-year housing program, promising in 10 years to house 1.8 million people in Hong Kong, when the population there at that time was only 4 million. So you can, you can sense the scale of those reforms. Um, it was also in the same period when you have a lot of relaxation on uh, media operating in Hong Kong, and also the ICAC, the um, Independent Commission Against Corruption, Commissions being uh, an operative word here because it's uh, quite a controversial issue in today's environment. So it was an ironic product of the 1967 disturbance uh, that the, the British colonial government saw this legitimacy and recognition enhanced from this particular battle. And I think we need to situate that understanding in the context of a Cold War battle. See the juxtaposition the chaos in Maoist China that was responsible, inspiring, if not orchestrating, the chaos in Hong Kong. The stability and prosperity, thanks to the British colonial government, at least that's the way we've come to understand it. What follows is actually something that you see, not just in history books, but um, even in economics today. Hong Kong became one of the four little dragons, tigers. It was an economic miracle that took place in Hong Kong. And so I guess knowing my background can forgive me for being a little bit more quantitative and trying to show to you how spectacular it was. This is the chart of um, GDP growth, so and the production in Hong Kong, from the late 60s all the way to the mid 90s. You can see here, for much of the period, which we have come to refer to as the golden era, Hong Kong did register some outrageously high growth rates. North of 20% in quite a few years. North of 10% in most years. Now just to put it in context so that we know comparatively how, how outrageous this, this, this was, we get excited now with the fastest growing large economy of today's environment straight to the north of Hong Kong, China. How fast is this growing? 6% currently. 6-7%. This is Hong Kong. Right? Now, you also have to hold me accountable to having lived through that period. Uh, I do remember that my uh, little plate of rice in my canteen in um, high school um, did go up from I don't know, 350 to 450 to $5. Inflation was running rampant in this period too. So we need to adjust the growth rate for inflation. It doesn't look all that bad either. North of 5% is a real growth rate. So adjusting for the cost of living um, that, that uh, skyrocketed in that particular period. More erratic, but still pretty impressive growth rate. So what then did the city do with such um, phenomenal economic growth? It was actually orchestrated not just by the government itself, the public, the media all played a role in creating this particular narrative, which is the topic, the top, top, prosperity and stability. And you see it at least in the Chinese, well in the English version, the, the, the sequence of the words can, can change every now and then, but, but in Chinese, um, at least the, the part of stability can be um, uh, one thing, can be an thing. So mm -hmm. you, you, see, you see multiple renditions of that um, in, the, uh, in the Chinese newspapers. This is not a new term for Hong Kong, not invented for the situation in Hong Kong. When you think about post-war reconstruction, when you think about the world of decolonization, when you think about the world of Cold War dynamics, Different regimes were fighting for the hearts and minds of the people. 
not necessarily with democracy and freedom. This appealed to many people in the masses. As a matter of fact, if I can just um, show you a few um, newspaper clippings here, this is a reference to uh, prosperity and stability uh, when the city of Hong Kong was trying to retain the governor um, that oversaw the, uh, the crisis of the late 60s, David Trench. This is one um, that was uh, from the period when McElhoes uh, first reported duties in Hong Kong. Again, it refers to prosperity and stability. This one is from the late 70s. This is the beginning of the negotiations when it really uh, started in earnest between the British and the Chinese government when um, the, the hand-picked successor of uh, Mao, uh, Hua, was talking to uh, the newspapers, the media in Hong Kong, uh, or reported in the, in the media in Hong Kong of the talks between him and the British government, again, about the stability and prosperity of Hong Kong. Stability and prosperity. Projection of Hong Kong's stability and prosperity. Retain trench for Hong Kong's stability and, and prosperity. What am I doing with these two terms? What exactly can one do with it? Well, it's I, my my uh, curiosity from this is that they, they they were they were over the news every day when I was growing up in Hong Kong, and I think you can still see resonance of that in today's uh, newspapers or TV reporting, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So what I then decided to do is well I'll I'll look it up in the very various databases um, that I have at my disposal in Hong Kong. Actually, you do too, because it's all online. Mm -hmm. And you can see, certainly, um, the, the data resonates with what I experienced in the mid-80s. You have many references that Presento in the mid-80s, um, as the joint declaration was getting negotiated and signed, um, not just from pro-Beijing newspapers talking about one country, two systems, as a way of ensuring the prosperity and stability of Hong Kong. You have some of the pro-business, pro-Taiwan newspapers reporting exactly the same. Uh, not just about the business people's world, uh, the business world's um, preoccupation with this concept, but also people who are um, on the British side of the game as well. So you see a convergence of a confluence of these various parties talking primarily about these two concepts when the future of Hong Kong was becoming increasingly uncertain. So what I then decided to do was to proceed to three different databases. Um, you see here, the, the, the English one uh, with the bar, is uh, the preeminent um, English newspaper in Hong Kong that uh, ran through the whole period, the South China Morning Post. The one with the orange is old Hong Kong newspapers. It's actually a database uh, provided by the Hong Kong Public Libraries. And you can see precisely the newspapers that uh, is part of that collection. Unfortunately, it ended in the early 90s. But then, thank goodness, we have Wise News, which captures Hong Kong newspapers of a more recent period. So I went into these various databases to chart in my quasi-big data way how we can appreciate the narrative that was floating around in this uh, print media throughout the period. And this is what I discovered. South China Morning Post. As I said, it's not a, a, a phrase that was coined for Hong Kong, so you have some of the very isolated appearances, occurrences in the early part of the 20th century uh, that seem to have um, taken up ever so slightly in the late 60s during the period of riots that I talked to you about. Mm -hmm. But what is noticeable is mm -hmm. this is a sign of British negotiation and then the conclusion uh, that resulted in the joint declaration. Mm -hmm. And this is the corresponding chart in Chinese newspapers. Mm -hmm. You see a more pronounced spike in the 60s, in the late 60s, in the aftermath of the riots but an equally noticeable rise in 83-84. See the spike there. Now if we were to zoom in a little bit, just, just for clearer visuals, I am starting with 
um, the conclusion of the riots all the way to the present day, you can see even more clearly the spike in the 80s, and then we'll cover the implications of this in a little bit. Same thing in Chinese. This is the, this is the Chinese newspapers. So how should we then read such frequency charts, if you can call it that? Well, I, I do that quite a bit uh, with uh, my students back home. Um, actually, in more or less the same period, there was a campaign called Clean Hong Kong Campaign. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of that. There is a lovely mascot called uh, Lao Zhang Chong, the, uh, the, the, the rubbish monster. It's kind of like a Sesame Street type of thing. Um, so I, I, I find it quite um, intriguing that many of my students would say, oh yeah, I found this Clean Hong Kong campaign. Uh, let me submit um, that in, as part of my paper to tell you that Hong Kong was very clean in the 70s. You know, think again, if you're very clean, you don't need a clean Hong Kong campaign. <laughs> so I would suggest to you, this is precisely how we need to read things in reverse. Mm -hmm. That would tell you the story. The more you need, you need to talk about prosperity and stability, the less certain you are of those terms mm -hmm. and the existence of that phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? So how then do people experience it then? How would these terms resonate with them or not? Well, I am giving you another set of charts, and again, this is back to my own training. This is Hong Kong. You're talking about financial city. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the Hang Seng Index. What you see here is the movement of the Hang Seng Index during the period of the negotiation, and I guess I, I should have, but if you, you, can, you can basically see how the dips and the, and the, and the uh, peaks of this is the, the inverse or what we see in both the Chinese and English newspapers in terms of references to prosperity and stability. And this is a longer duration of that, so you see how it did uh, when uncertainty was, was uh, at, at its highest, and then it was fine by the time the joint declaration was signed and, and um, the stock market recovered. And this is a long duration, all the way to um, the handover period. Now, a city cannot possibly just run on one narration, a narrative. By the late 80s, a new narrative was emerging. And that's probably one that you and I are more familiar with today because we talk about it more, especially as part of the political movement in Hong Kong. And I guess it's just no big surprise that it was um, democracy and freedom. Why am I highlighting it here for you? Well, we tend to talk about it today in this environment as something that's universal. Who does not want democracy? Who would not want freedom? And it's something that we just assume that it started and it's always a currency since time immemorial. But is that true? If these are the universal values that, that, that have been cherished evenly and uniformly across time and space, why did we have such a strong period of talks about prosperity and stability without much mention? I mean, there were some instance, instances when, when you talk about democracy and freedom as well, but really minute. Um, why, why then did that happen? How did that happen? We wake up one day and decide that it's time for our democracy and freedom? So I did the same thing um, in terms of database searches as I did for prosperity and stability, and this is what I found. English newspapers, references to democracy and freedom. Mm. Not surprisingly, in the period of the Second World War, mm -hmm. in the aftermath there was democracy and freedom. No big deal. Same thing in the 70s, coinciding with um, the golden year we're talking about. Guess where it spiked? Why to talk? Why 89? Huh? Tenement. Tenement, okay, that's certainly true. But I would challenge us to even stretch our imagination even more. June 4th was 1989. There were other things happening around the world at that time too. Right, so if you see the references there, 
the hot situation in Hong Kong was not an isolated incident. Mm -hmm. You can see it again more clearly uh, now that I'm zooming into that particular period. See the spike in 1989. Mm -hmm. This is a Chinese newspaper. Again, in the post-war period, a more noticeable spike again in um, 60, uh, 68 after the riots, but then a spike here in 89 as well. A little bit more clearly as I just zoom in on that particular period. Now, if I were to put it together, let's see what happens. The orange line is stability and prosperity. The blue line is democracy and freedom. Guess what? If you were to just trust the newspapers and the reportings and references to those values, the preoccupation with prosperity and stability overwhelmed by a large margin for all the years of this analysis. Democracy and freedom, which came to be mentioned sometimes in tandem in terms of spikes, but for the most part, on a much smaller scale. Again, this is the uh, this is the uh, Chinese version for you. There were times when we thought we could have it all. This is a newspaper article from 1984. You don't need to hurry democracy. It says here, should be introduced gradually in Hong Kong in the run-up to 1997 in order to maintain prosperity and stability. You should have it, but don't do it to hurt prosperity and stability. Now things change a little bit. So the one to your left is from 1991. Well, they should go, they should go together. There's no, there's no conflict between democracy and prosperity and stability. So in 97, a few months ahead of the handover, I guess we have a you know, quickened pace of some sort. We need to have prosperity and democracy going hand in hand. We need to have them together. So what, I, what, I, what, what we'll do, um, I, I'll dial forward to some of the uh, turning points, but I want us to put ourselves in the mindset of someone who just experienced the golden year of Hong Kong, the takeoff, the economic takeoff of the 70s, early 80s, and you have the political crisis of the joint, what produced the joint declaration. You want to save the economic success that you have. You're not as you're not as consumed about the political side of things. And by 1984, the de joint declaration was signed. The question then is, hmm, okay, uh, we have another 13 years before uh, 1997. Uh, we'll get ready for it. Then come eight, 1989, of course many things happening around the world, but the most, the closest to home was what happened June 4th. What do you do? It's going to be eight short years before you need to be part of this great entity called China, and something cat catastrophic just happened there. Then the rhetoric changed, but apparently if you were to look at what I'm showing you here on the charts, not so much so, that um, it was going to change the direction of where Hong Kong was going. So 1989, this was a picture that tells it all. Hong Kong became as uh, energized, mobilized as it had, it had ever been up to that point. Millions marched in Hong Kong. Guess what we had as part of the outcome of that process? The Bill of Rights. So we have to remember the Bill of Rights was but a late colonial invention. It was drafted, discussed, prepared in 1990. It was passed in 1991. No one did it in 1984 after the Joint Declaration was finalized. You can see, I mean, I don't, I, we don't have documents yet because they're still closed, um, but we can never find it in, well, I don't think we'll get that. Yeah, I can find it in the Beijing archives in my lifetime, but <laughs> the Q archives, they're still closed, so I cannot see what, what happened um, in the discussions. But you can infer from the timeline how things unfolded in the aftermath of June 4th and in the run-up to 1997, so the Bill of Rights, 1991. Another 
turning point, I would suggest that we look at 2003. Horrible year in Hong Kong. SARS, of course, we know that. But I will put an even more horrible picture in front of you. <laughs> I, I, meant, I meant Bill. Uh, reach our, our security chief at that time, um, Regina Ip, introduced Article 23. Article 23 being part of the basic law, the mini constitution in Hong Kong, um, that made, that makes Hong Kong responsible for introducing legislation um, against uh, treason and against the, um, uh, any attempts to um, ally yourself with uh, foreign political powers. Now again, just like in 1989, huge unrest in Hong Kong. This time not quite a million, but uh, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands uh, took to the street. The bill ended up being withdrawn, and uh, Regina um, then took off and she appeared somewhere in North America and uh, decided to pursue um, a postgraduate degree, which she completed and then returned. So if we were to think of SARS as something that, an ep epidemic that um, really took its toll on the economic situation in Hong Kong, Article 23 was a political crisis. What do we do instead? Or what do we do at, in that particular year to fix those problems? Well, I would submit for your consideration that we somehow had some misplaced emphasis. So instead of trying to figure out what to do with a bill that is in the basic law, we have here the individual visit scheme that began on uh, July 28, 2003, allowing mainland Chinese tourists to come to Hong Kong, of course, with the uh, purpose of spending more money in Hong Kong, recover, uh, engineering a certain recovery uh, of the Hong Kong economy. And to a certain extent it worked, but then it also flooded the streets of Hong Kong with mainland, ma many mainland tourists and resulted in tensions and conflicts. And it's only actually in recent months that um, that, that abated. But my bigger issue is we continue to address the situation in 2003, primarily through economic means, ignoring the underlying political issue that was inflicting a lot of pain on the city. Now, dial forward to a topic that um, you'll be covering in the next few weeks, uh, as Leo um, advertised, the umbrella movement. What we see here is that the old narrative prosperity and stability did not seem to fit the bill for, at least for some people in Hong Kong. Same charts, dial forward. What you see here is the GDP growth. If you were to just look at the pre-handover period, everything seemed to be up quite a few notches. Down a few notches here. Being an honest economist, I will adjust for inflation for you. Still noticeable. And as a matter of fact, gone into negative territory quite a bit. That's not the worst of it. This is a Gini coefficient. So the higher it is, the, the more disparity between the rich and the poor in a city. And you can see that it rose quite drastically right around the handover and continue to, to creep up. Now, I, I love these numbers, but I, I feel that, that they don't quite tell you um, a real personal story and the closest I can get to it is to look at the median monthly income. You can see how income rose quite drastically for both men and women and the overall population from the 70s, the 80s to the 90s. And it seemed to have reached a certain plateau by the handover period and flattened out. And that is not the complete story. I'm not quite adjusting for cost of living here for you, but I would just alert you to one particular aspect. Real estate prices in Hong Kong. <laughs> Again, this is not quite specific in Hong Kong. I think as we uh, look back in 10, 20 years, as we look at um, outrageous real estate prices in cosmopolitans around the world, in the low in interest rate re regime, has done us in. Certainly in Hong Kong, it was quite dramatic. As you can see from 
2003 is basically a straight climb, except for a few dips that lasted just for short periods of time. Now, I mean, if, if, uh, if, if you guys are paying a lot of attention and trying to hold me responsible, you say, I thought you talked about a Hang Seng. Why are we not looking at the Hang Seng Index? Why are we switching to housing? I have here three columns of the largest components of the Hang Seng Index. What are the reds and the whites? Mm. So the red chips are truly red. The whites are Hong Kong companies. 1998, there was but one red chip that made up the top 10 of the Hang Seng Index. That's China Mobile. By 2008, only one company remained in the top 10 from Hong Kong. Everything else was a red chip company. And you and I will recognize all those names because they either bake um, industrial companies, uh, te te uh, technological companies, industrial companies um, in China. The only, th the only one left, HSBC. Dial forward to 2018, it's even worse. The only one left, HSBC, had fallen quite a few notches. So going back to real estate, just so that we can uh, we can see how that was affecting the lives of people. The real estate market in Hong Kong was okay um, in, during the period of hyper growth because every now and then, whether it was because of oil prices, because of the um, Sino-British negotiations or June 4th, it would take a toll on housing prices or housing prices would take a toll every five years or so. But if you were to look at this chart, since 2003, it's basically a straight shot up since the SARS. I would suggest that we can actually do some demographical exploration of this dimension as we think about who is on the street, who is actually very discontent with the situation. Now, I think in Hong Kong, it's becoming a little bit of an epidemic of sort that um, we have uh, young people who feel that they are entitled to uh, at least some real estate holdings by the time they get out of college. I didn't, I had to struggle. But to be realistic, if you need to save up for a down payment, uh, what should we assume? You're 30 years old and you should be able to buy a, uh, start with something. Um, okay, if you were not 30 years old in 2003, you've been a little bit younger and you've been saving to chase the outrageously um, expensive market that's only getting more expensive, You'll be in 2019, so that would make you somewhere in your mid-40s, and you're still not propertyed. So the real estate market, the real estate market, but the real estate holdings being a primary form of wealth um, storage in Hong Kong is a good telltale sign of the haves and the have-nots in Hong Kong. So what do we see here in terms of um, the real prices, just so that we are closer to, to home in terms of real prices instead of just indexes? Meifu um, Sanchuan, this is a, a middle-class um, oasis of sort that started in the late um, 60s and has remained uh, somewhat of a barometer of real estate prices for the middle class in Hong Kong. You see here in the, in the mid to late 90s, um, about $3,000 Hong Kong, Hong Kong dollars per square foot. So that would be what, 600 Canadian? So 600 Canadian, you want to buy a 500 uh, square foot apartment, don't be, don't, don't be holding us to Canadian standards, we live in small places. That would be 300,000 Canadian. Today, that would have gone up four times. So the shoe box that people be happy to call home is now call it a million two Canadian. Let's be more ambitious, let's cross the harbor where the rich and famous live, but then we'll just go to yet another more middle class enclave, um, Taikusheng. It's about uh, double that price. Same type of appreciation. So think, keep this chart in mind as you are looking at um, explanations of what's going on in Hong Kong. 
hopefully beyond just the political slogans. You have real material economic factors that will be driving people's sentiments. And by that I don't mean whether you feel that you, 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 you have it or not because I um, actually I, I have seen recently a report from some colleagues in Hong Kong reporting that uh, in the protests you have a lot of um, uh, people on the streets who are reportedly well-educated, middle class, uh, they're, they're doing it for the f fear of uh, losing their freedom. Granted, I understand that. Um, but then we cannot quite just measure it in a static way. This is, has been a dynamic process that's been going on for decades. And more importantly, just to go back to the landslide victory of Sunday, 80 seats uh, won by the entire establishment camp. But you have to remember, it's a winners take all game. And the golden ratio, the 60-40, you just need to have 60% of votes to, to get all the seats, um, still holds. What that means is that we are ignoring the 40, the 40% 40 who are still voting for the establishment. So it looks great, hunky-dory, from our freedom-loving uh, Western sense of the world, but then if you were to really go to Hong Kong and see how divided the city is, you can sense that, well, there's still a decent chunk of the population that is still holding on to the old narrative. Why are they holding on to the narrative? I mean, it, you, you have a lot of um, analysis that would say, oh, well, those are just um, people who don't know better. Uh, they, they are bus into the polling station and they will vote for the establishment uh, just for some mooncakes. Well, maybe that's some of that. But 40% of 3 million that voted, I would hope that Hong Kong is, as, as a city is not that naive. And that's a real situation, a real um, demand that we need to pay attention to in addition to just our uh, yeah, assumption of universal love for democracy and freedom. You see that playing out. Just, not just in the numbers, but also in the way the, uh, the government is trying to capture this narrative. So uh, prosperity and stability, those are the, the, the catchphrases, the, the keywords, the, or the hallmarks of that particular period. Um, the, the, the imagery of that period was actually The Lion Rock, uh, which was a TV series in the 70s. 2013, right, uh, before the, um, the Umbrella Movement, the Hong Kong government launched a campaign called Hong Kong Our Home. And you can see in there a song that's called Sail On, not just with references to the Lion Rock, where this is a, um, the Lion Rock bears witness to all who came, who, who come and go. But then if I were to play some, I, I won't bore you with that, but if you can go back to the song, the chorus is actually from the Lion Rock um, song of the 70s. And guess what? It backfired. Huh. So Lion Rock is iconic, um, certainly in, in um, the media, songs and otherwise, but then it also became an iconic site, which is why, even now, you have people hanging banners from the head of the Lion Rock um, whenever there is a certain demand, and this is quite a gesture. And just recently, can you see here, Lady Liberty, the, the white sculpture? has stood um, actually on my very campus uh, outside of the uh, Student Union um, canteen across from the Pillar of Shame, which is the memorial to June 4th. One night, uh, in the middle of all the protests, all the turmoil in Hong Kong, mountain climbers moved this Lady Liberty up to the top of the Lion Rock. <laughs> Quickly enough, you have people from the other camp uh, destroying it, and I think it's been uh, shredded to pieces by now. Mm -hmm. But you can see the contestation Mm -hmm. over the narrative, not just in the textual form, but also in some iconic moments uh, of the movements. Mm -hmm. Now just to go back to the Umbrella Movement for a little bit. What I find um, wanting, uh, especially as we compare today's situation to five years ago, was uh, a more genuine engagement with the powers to be. Five years ago, we have the fearless leader, cut out of him anyway, 
appearing on um, our protest sites, MOT, Mong Kok. So I'm not doing it just, just for official reasons. You can see, actually, in uh, photos of that, from photos from that particular period, mm -hmm. Joshua Wong, Alex Chow, protesting, appealing to, to Beijing to overturn the decision that Beijing reached on August 31st of that year, and to engage Beijing in a dialogue. I think, unfortunately, we are not quite doing as much of that because we totally reject Beijing as a power to be in the Hong Kong situation. Is that really the way we can go? I think that's something we can debate. So to go back to our new concerns, democracy and freedom, you can see here, again, the spike of 1989. And not surprisingly, spike again, 2003, after lovely uh, discussion about Article 23, again, 2014, today. This is an English newspaper. Wise news, so that I focus on the Chinese newspapers in Hong Kong. Same thing, 2004. And then you have the umbrella movement today. But are the new concerns the only things that preoccupy the minds of Chinese of, of Hong Kong people? Not quite. Let me extend the analysis to the present day on uh, prosperity and stability. You see that we have the same spike in the aftermath of the discussion of Article 23. Same thing in the umbrella movement. Same thing today. This is sub China Morning Post. And this is the same thing, Chinese newspapers. You can see that a good segment of the population, a good portion of the way we talked about uh, what's going on in Hong Kong through the various rounds of turmoil, will still refer to this old dogma of prosperity and stability. And again, putting them together in SCMP is only in 2019 to date that prosperity and stability is almost as high in frequency as, or actually, freedom and democracy is almost reaching the same level of, of frequency as prosperity and stability. That I find surprising. I thought we, we are all talking about a protest who is still talking about prosperity and stability. Same thing in the Chinese newspapers. Now, because I'm doing this project, I'm paying attention to what people say, especially um, the movers and shakers. And you see here, this is just from a few months ago, after the, um, the outbreak of the, uh, of the turmoil in Hong Kong, this is a PLA um, person talking about uh, prosperity and stability. Carrie Liam herself, uh, who doesn't usually appear often, um, showed up every now and then. And that's what she talked about. Uh, let me play her voice to you here. Prosperity and stability. Her boss said the same thing. November 14th. As I'm doing it, I, I can't even keep up with how often it appears because just this Monday, this past Monday, as uh, I just landed here in, in Vancouver, uh, the, the Chinese foreign ministers, Wang Yi, after he talked to uh, Abe, said again, no matter what happens in Hong Kong, no, what, no matter what happens, Hong Kong is part of China. Of course, what, what he was referring to was the, uh, the landslide victory of the anti-establishment camp on Sunday. And he also said, uh, when, when 
体呃，对，都不可以，嗯，得逞。So anything that that hap, that that、um, is intended to mess up Hong Kong and to damage its prosperity and stability would not quite be successful. So this is this is again just recently. This is just earlier this week. You and I may think that this is a phrase from the 80s, but the politicians still find that to be having a great currency. <coughs> but the, the, the narrative applied to just the、uh, politicians. No, well, Li Kaxing says the same thing.、Mm -hmm. Is it just people as rich as Li Kaxing? Well, let's think based on what I said about、uh, the demographics, the votes from、um, from Sunday. Well, you have 40% of the voters still voting for the establishment, in spite of the violence that we see, the brutality of the police and the,、uh, and the stubbornness of、um, of Carrie Lam and the regime. So that's got to be something in there for the die-hard,、um, what we call the blue silk people who are in the blue camp,、um, pro police, pro establishment. They have their vested interests. They've done well for themselves. So with the prosperity they are enjoying, of course they want stability. The re reverse is also true. Regardless of what we think, what we report to be the well-educated and、um, uh, middle-class, self-reported middle-class of the、uh, of the protesters, there are some radicals who would find prosperity not a tenable notion, and they don't care for stability because of that. Hence, if we burn, you burn with us. So you can see how the two sides are actually torn, not just. Um, by political issues, but also economic factors as well. And here, let me also echo the, the disclaimer: not all wealthy people are pro-establishment. That's for sure. But then you can see some delineation in the, the demography as we look at today's、uh, Hong Kong and the camps that、um, it、uh, uh, you see on the streets, and the enduring impact of the old narrative of prosperity and、uh, stability. Not just in political rhetoric, but in the way、um, that proposition is animating different parts of the population. Now, let me broaden out a little bit to the grander notion of one country, two systems. So, we think about that. Is it a political proposition or an economic proposition? After all, Deng Xiaoping promised us that、uh, you'll continue to have horse racing and you can still dance in the city of Hong Kong. There's no mention of votes or freedom. I guess freedom only to to dance and to gamble. <laughs> so perhaps the, the、uh, in, in fact, well, as a matter of fact, when he said that Hong Kong no democracy, and as we saw in the basic、um, uh, the, the Bill of Rights, it was something that's introduced much later. So how should we appreciate this whole issue of one country, two systems?、Uh, now that we we construct mostly as a political interpretation. Less so an economic construct that Deng Xiaoping had come up with, and where exactly are we now? You know, Hong Kong people are known to be very money-minded, so、um, Homo economicus. That we evolved to become Homo politicus, <laughs> and if that's the case, how do those factors actually intertwine? How do we then produce our demands in a more sensible way? Of course, we need to to have universal suffrage and elect our chief executive. The Basic Law said that, Article Forty Five. The ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal universal suffrage. Same thing, Article Sixty Eight. Legal members. The ultimate aim is the election of all the members of the Legislative Council by universal suffrage. It was the promise. You owe us that. Let's go back to 2003. Article 23 precedes Article 45 and Article 68. We can argue on the basis of the Basic Law that we should have universal suffrage both in the election of our chief executive and our legislative council. I'm all for that. But then I also wonder. If there was built into this document the wisdom of that period, that is very much a crippled quote. Then you do need to acknowledge the power of Beijing, 
before you can elect your own to govern your city. So where does it leave us? Well, we have gone beyond the political demands and look at the historical development, both the economic development of Hong Kong and also the narrative, the, the public, the media, the government um, have uh, created to explain to us what we have done and how that might have produced a fractured population animated differently in today's environment. We've teased out the material factors that operated in conjunction with political factors. We have questioned what the problems might have been. Um, in the 80s, China was materially backward, unstable, versus Hong Kong in the 80s, stable and prosperous. But then since then, Hong Kong has continued to be prosperous, at least for a good chunk of our population, but has become increasingly underwritten by Chinese factors. We call the Hang Seng Index slide. Have we developed too much of a reliance on China? Has that economic over reliance spilled over to political baggage and liabilities? Now, I'll, I'll, I'll admit any day of the week, economic factors are not all of it. They are necessary, but not, is then not sufficient. But what are we to do? You cannot simply replicate history. Hong Kong became so economically powerful, not just because the government says so, not just because of the sweat and blood that we poured into the city, but because of geopolitical factors, the Cold War, um, and the rise of, of economic China, on which, we, uh, on which coattail we rode. But then we also have to acknowledge that the Hong Kong government has been losing its legitimacy. It's not democratically elected. Um, provision for economic life, or at least the promise of better life, um, that's been failing. They've been failing us. Versus what's going on with the CCP in the mainland. Ironically, what you see in mainland China today is actually quite reminiscent of what Hong Kong experienced in the 70s and 80s. 6-7% growth, life is hunky-dory, um, so long as the government doesn't bother us, why do you want to change anything? So maybe prosperity and stability is what the people of China wants now. Now back to the original question I had. Um, democracy and freedom, consider them universal value. Not time dependent, not space dependent. True. But if we were to look at prosperity and stability in conjunction with that, <coughs> maybe those are things that people all want, just like world peace. But then the importance you put on it could be out of sync varies according to the condition of the time and the location that you're referring to. So we have a political crisis in Hong Kong. Uh, we have to engage with the PRC on this whole issue of one country. And the economic variation of the population in Hong Kong is not something that we can afford to ignore because differences in an economic sense uh, have driven people to act differently and not everybody in Hong Kong is supporting the protest. Remember the 40% who voted for the establishment. So do I have an answer for you? No, I'm a historian only, and I can only pr produce for you the narrative that's been constructed and hopefully produce some, provide us with some thoughts for analysis. We do need a new narrative for the next phase of Hong Kong. We need to come up with new dynamics for the city, a new narrative, and hopefully We'll find out what will work for Hong Kong in the years to come. So thank you very much. There's no fire. It was an alert system, I think. Thank you very much, um, John. Um, I just want to um, point out that the newspaper databases that you use, um, we do have access here. Uh, South China Morning Post, we do have it. The old newspapers, of course, are um, publicly available. Um, so people who are interested in doing, replicating what you do or doing something standing, we can do that. <laughs> but I also want to, I, I kept on forgetting to do, um, I should acknowledge a few um, uh, sponsors. Um, so first of all, I want to acknowledge that we are in the territory of uh, the uh, Musqueam people, uh, the ancestral unceded land. So we are very grateful to be able to hold all our events uh, on campus, uh, on their land. I also want to thank our students, helpers, uh, Michelle, uh, Justin, um, Zoe, and Ryan. Um, thank you for our team for helping us out. 
Also for our institutional sponsors, Department of Asian Studies History, the Institute of Asian Research, St. John's College. <laughs> so, so I, want to, I know that we are, we are um, I'm mindful of time, but I also want to turn the floor briefly to um, Dr. Clement Tong. Uh, Clement wears many hats, um, but I want to point out a few things. He teaches a course for us at, on campus, uh, the history of Cantonese world. That's our attempt to, again, broaden um, our focus beyond just Hong Kong, but to think about Hong Kong in a larger context of South China, the history of South China, diaspora. So uh, very grateful for him to take on that. Um, he's also teaching a new course, uh, not for us, uh, but for Kuan Lun. Um, he's teaching a new course next term on Hong Kong past, present, and future. So we are very happy that he's taking, well, I'm not sure if that's the way to put it, but I like to think of it other ways. That is what we have been doing at UBC and extending it beyond UBC. And that's, that's um, something that we uh, always looking forward to do. So please, uh, come and come. Well, thank you, John, for the sharing. <clears throat> I know you can't wait to ask him questions and uh, put him on the spot, so I'm not going to take very long. Um, I also like the way he says, uh, uh, I'm not a historian by training, but I talk about history and do historical work. So we're not here to actually solve problems, right? We're just going to point it out so that you can solve it for us. Um, I really like the way John talks about looking sometimes beyond the slogans and uh, some of the things that people say whenever you, sometimes when you, the more you talk about stability and prosperity, the less you have it. Um, I think it's very true as uh, John reminds uh, us about the 1967 rise in Hong Kong. Remember back then, in the late, well, I don't remember back then because I can't be on it too, so I'm kind of younger than that. But uh, in, the, in the late uh, August of 1967, um, the, the Red Guards actually sacked and burned the British Embassy in Beijing. Uh, it was very uh, chaotic. And two weeks later, uh, David Chen, uh, they were having an internal meeting, and one of the the classified report reads that I'll read to you. They're actually thinking about asking the Americans to help, very much like uh, Hong Kong protesters now waving American flags, uh, flags and asking uh, President Trump to help Hong Kong. Uh, back then, the British got did the same, uh, asking Americans, would you help us, you know, whether you come or issue some statements. And this is what the report reads. Um, uh, according to the British. Americans would like us to stay in Hong Kong as long as possible because of Hong Kong's values for intelligence purposes and its political value as a free world enclave on the mainland of China. For domestic as well as international reasons, however, they would be very unlikely to be willing to give a public nuclear guarantee for Hong Kong, nor for our own reasons would we wish them to do so. So looks like they were asking, is there any chance for you to issue some nuclear you know, guarantee that if China took Hong Kong back before the time that you would you know, bomb them? <laughs> so Americans, of course, very wisely say, well, stay there as long as you can. You're doing great work, but no, 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 we're going to stay out of this. Among all this chaos, David Tran sounded very confident to the Hong Kong people. Even though there's, as John mentioned, there's evacuation plans, very much like Americans leaving Vietnam in the 70s. Uh, the plans talking about evaluating, uh, evacuating British subjects and Chinese uh, from Hong Kong. But David Chen sounds very uh, strong and confident. And you know what? Two months later, well, about a month and a half later, Hong Kong has its first Hong Kong festival. Um, that was supposed to be a, a fashion festival, but got developed into a territory-wide celebration of stability and prosperity, saying that we're going to celebrate despite all this chaos that's happening. Of course, the other side start planning more bombs when it started in, uh, on October 30th, 1967. But that's what happened. And two years later, they have an even bigger celebration called 1968 Hong Kong Festival. And actually, Hong Kong had three festivals uh, through its history. 1969, 1971, 1973. Uh, among the most uh, chaotic, uncertain days after the riots, 
uh, they stage this territory-wide celebration, big budget, uh, lots of campaign going on, floats, uh, dancing, uh, competitions, all kinds of things to portray this image of stability and prosperity. So I think you're right. The more uncertain we felt, the more we want to emphasize that we do have it. So uh, to cut my sharing very short, just thank you so much, John, for your sharing. And I'll make sure next time I hear the Hong Kong government talk about how good things are, I'll look between and read between your feet, between your lines, and find out what exactly is going wrong with them. <laughs> thank you. So the floor is, um, John, can you? Sure. Yeah. So the floor is open for comments, questions. Uh, we have a microphone if you want to use one. If you have a loud voice, can we go into it? So, go ahead. John, I was originally from Hong Kong, and I actually um, came to, to Vancouver um, as a result of the riots in 1967 when I was scheduled, in fact, to return to work at the university, having uh, worked at Queen Mary Hospital with Professor McFadden in those days, a long time ago. My question is, the sp uh, prosperity and stability, have that had any impact on improving education in Hong Kong? Is that, Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, so the the question is on education. Uh, the closest I can I can think about um, to that linkage is how I became the first crop of the nine-year compulsory education. So stability means that you keep all these young people off the street, mm. and in the process, you are you are educated in a relatively uniform system. That gives you a sense of value. Now, I don't recall prosperity and stability being part of my education per se, but to to see that ah, there is this gradual process. So you go from uh, primary one to primary six and then secondary school. There's a certain teleological approach to it, and the higher you climb, the better your future will be. At least that's how I've been told, and it seemed to have worked. At least in the 70s and 80s. So, if that is prosperity and stability at work in education in um, developing a certain mindset of um, school-aged children. I guess that would be it. Um, I, th I think uh, we have a similar situation in the 90s, the period around the handover, and I'm not sure it's done as well, frankly, because we have a proliferation of university uh, programs, which I am all for, because education is good for anyone. But then at the same time, we have not seemed to have developed a certain um, narrative or dialogue about why you're going to school, what, what they're supposed to promise you. Mm -hmm. So when the economic results are what you see there in terms of flattening medium, median income, then people feel that they have spent so much more time on it and sort of families have spent so much money on education. Mm -hmm. What am I going to get for it? Mm -hmm. Right. So it, 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 we have to be mindful of the general macroeconomic backdrop. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I sense that that might be something in there that we can explore further. Thank you. Uh, Justin, can you bring the microphone? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is a little bit uh, off. Um, I have, uh, thank you for that presentation. It's very interesting. From looking at the frequency of the media, the prosperity and stabilities, and how you relate it to the democracy and freedom, I am just. It reminds me of one of the essays that a student proposed to do, which is um, trying to understand how confident an individual with disability feels. And every morning, they walk up in the morning and ask the participants, are you happy with what you see? So in a way, um, that is to probe the individual's self-confidence. What you presented almost seems like a reflection of what the society feels as a whole, but is re reflected in the media. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, I'm just curious, for that specific period of time, 
in the 60s, late 60s, in the 80s, in current time. Apart from what the media's frequency is, what are the people saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of looking forward to see what the umbrella interviewee will be saying in terms of these two terms. Mm -hmm. But very interesting study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we'll take one more. Sure. I, I might call in the back, right? And then we got just a, few, sure. a couple more questions. Uh, thank you for this uh, very, very interesting and very uh, revealing presentation. I have one question about methodology, which really follows up the lady's question, mm -hmm. and then I guess a kind of a statement. Uh, Using the statistical analysis of the media, I, I just wonder if that is really a methodologically sound way to find out what people in society think, because the media is owned by certain people and the media reflects whatever their owners and their editors want to say. That's my methodological question. My statement is that I think prosperity and stability versus freedom and democracy. First of all, is there anyone who doesn't want prosperity and stability? Who, know, who doesn't want to live under that kind of system? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, as we can see, capitalism doesn't produce it in a very fair way. And the Chinese capitalist system is not much different from the American capitalist system in terms of the Gini coefficient and all that. Mm -hmm. And I think a bigger problem is a world problem that, as Dostoevsky pointed out, people would prefer stability to freedom, right? The first thing I was thinking was, was hard times and Sissy Chuk and her response about utilitarianism. What about the British GDP being so great? And she said, well, it depends on how much of it I have, uh, you know, how much of it is, comes to me. And, but I think the bigger question is, People, unfortunately, tend to want stability more than they want freedom, and that seems like a major problem for us today. Uh, let me try to tackle the two questions in, uh, in conjunction with one another, if I can. Uh, yeah, the, the question on uh, methodology. Now, I don't know if one can do this type of analysis in the present day quite as comfortably as in the 70s and the 80s, and even the 90s, when you can see there, uh, well, there, there were not a whole lot of uh, English newspapers and the, um, and the preeminence of the South China Morning Post is something that we can, we, can, um, uh, we can recognize more readily. But in terms of the Chinese newspapers, yes, uh, much of what they have to report is determined by the editorial, the editorial um, control. Why is the uh, old, China, old Hong Kong newspapers website so interesting? Is it, just as uh, the period in Hong Kong was interesting at that time, you have many newspapers, some really pro-Beijing, some really pro-KMT, pro some really uh, fighting for uh, the voice of businesses. And you have, you have that collection of voices which, make, um, the, which makes the aggregation of the data more meaningful. So I think that's the, that's, the, that's the basis of any big data analysis, right? So you, you have to have large enough samples so that um, the, the irregularities are uh, um, cancelled out. And I obviously didn't have time to get into that, but uh, when I was looking at the individual newspapers, uh, Da Feng Bao versus uh, Hua Xiao, um, you actually find some very interesting references in places that own. Well, I didn't know that the CCP in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, uh, before it concluded, was talking about prosperity and stability in a way that um, is no different from what the pro-Taiwan camp was, uh, was, was advocating. So there, there is enough in there that as you get into the, um, the nitty-gritty of the analysis, you can, you can tease out some of, the, some of the interesting facts, but then hopefully the, the, the aggregation of the data and the variety of newspapers um, covered by the databases I, I have used uh, would help um, alleviate some of the concerns about methodology. Uh, how do people receive it? Um, uh, that's uh, frankly not the uh, not the, the crux of the analysis at the moment, but I would point out though that um, those concepts are not static concepts, mm -hmm. and I think the uh, the British government recognized that. It's only in such a tremendous rising tide 
that you can promise people stability, uh, uh, prosperity is not how well you're doing and that you'll continue to do well. And the stability doesn't mean getting stuck. It means that the second derivative is powerful. You're getting wealthier faster over time, which certainly happened in the 70s, 80s, as we, as we see it in the aggregate data, and also in um, more the received wisdom that we have about people's lives in Hong Kong during that period. Um, and, the, and, and, and the way it doesn't work right now is that, yes, well, the, the second derivative has gone flat or even negative. Hong Kong is not slowing in terms of an, uh, its economic production, but not quite as fast as before. And when, you, when the tide is not rising and rising as rapidly, you can see the unevenness across the distribution, and that is what um, produced what we have seen in the more recent years. Um, maybe we'll have that. We'll take a couple more questions. Go ahead. But ask it briefly. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Wong, for sharing. And my question is on the 16th rights. And I wonder what was the social or ideological basis for that rights. Some of the radical writers only uh, even want to overthrow the colonial government in Hong Kong. I wonder was they based on a Hong Kong identity or a communist identity or a Chinese identity. And if you compare the ongoing chaos in Hong Kong and with the 60s, what are the uh, uh, similars or continuity and the new developments in terms of the identity politics? Thank you. Okay. And then that gentleman, right? You can bring the tape. Uh, my question is that uh, we are talking about prosperity, stability, democracy, and uh, freedom. And you mentioned about the inequality, the real estate price. But I think that inequality and the housing price is like global issues. Right? Mm -hmm. Now here you may do where you have the same situation. So mm -hmm. my question is that for the majority of Hong Kong people, are they willing to risk stability and prosperity for democracy and human rights mm -hmm. or freedom if so to a particular? Second question is about how no, many people identify. <laughs> are they associated with like, are they Chinese or like more associated with uh, Britain? That I think this is related to the future of Hong Kong. Thank you. We're going to take more, and then so we'll do one. My back. question will be very short. Yeah. Uh, in 1997, is there any possibility that Hong Kong can be returned to Taiwan House? <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> After 1967, there was like a series of programs launched. So one of them was ICAC. So do you see the prosperity and stability was one of the things that to promote, like promote by the establishment of ICAC was, or was it the other way around? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. We'll take one last one. All right. Yeah. I know we're not uh, predictors, yeah, now. but given your, given your background, your knowledge, and that you teach, you research in Hong Kong, you live in Hong Kong, and given what has just happened in district elections, can you share with us your thought, what might be some of the outcomes mm -hmm. going forward in Hong Kong? Yeah. What are some of the possibilities? Yeah. And how likely? Okay. These are just simple questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give, me, give me two seconds. Um, well, one, I'm not a sociologist, um, so some of the questions that you ask, I, I, it's not quite my approach, but I will try to tackle them more um, conceptually. Um, identities, um, late 60s versus now. Uh, actually, ICAC as well. Many of those questions, Chinese or not, Identities are created in a process of othering. And it was an easy comparison in the 60s that we want to be economically prosperous, and this is stable, unlike your mainland in the mess of the Cultural Revolution. So the, the reason the leftists lost is because there were quite a few people who fled the mainland to go to Hong Kong at that time in search for, a, a, for refuge. So if it's just as messy as it is north of the border, hmm, that doesn't quite work, right? Um, so we uh, dial forward to today's and to today's Hong Kong. Well, this whole am I Chinese or am I not Chinese? I feel that is a is a positioning statement again in terms of othering. Uh, it was a lot easier in the seventies to call myself a fellow Chinese with people on the other side of the border because they are the poor cousins. They were the attacks. 
<laughs> right? Now they're coming to Canton Road and they're buying all the expensive handbags that my wife loves to buy. And you're taking away all our baby formula. So I'm Chinese, but then you're making me the poor cousin and the impoverished one anyway, materially. So the process of othering, I think, has um, taken quite a, quite a reversal of fortune. And I, I see that as part of the process as we go from the 60s to today. ICEC, actually, interestingly, uh, that, that, that's my next project, and if I ever get to it, um, to me is also um, uh, interesting Cold War mirroring. We think of ICAC as Mecklehose invention for, for better Hong Kong. Yeah, it did produce better Hong Kong. But I also see it as a power struggle between the British governor and the British bureaucracy, primarily the police, mm -hmm. in a way that was executed in very much the same manner as the Cultural Revolution, which is finger pointing. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you were to think about it that way, the dynamics, the climate at the, at the time called for that and that actually engender the dynamics, but then it's packaged in a certain way under the British colonial regime that um, takes on a, a new story and a significance. Uh, Taiwan, uh, maybe I can link it to what Clement said about the US. Um, could have returned it to Taiwan? I guess the simple answer is no, even though at the moment of uh, handover, um, the, the ROC government did say we are the ones who will hold the uh, the, the, uh, the treaty that leads to new territories to you, British people. So if there's someone you have to return this to, return it to us. Fair chance. The, so when, when did the US actually have a say in Hong Kong and that was manifested in actually what happened in, on, on the ground? 1945. Hong Kong did not need to revert back to British colonial rule. It did, not back to the nationalist government and the rest is history. A large part of it is just the dynamics of the Second World War in which the British negotiators obviously played an important part. But the 1960s and 80s, it, um, the, the Americans were uh, actually interestingly quite silent about what was going on there. And I think even to uh, today, you can see an, um, somewhat of an awkward uh, spatial, locationing, uh, spatial location of the American Consulate General, where I need to go to, to renew my passport every now and then, um, sitting right next to the government house. I mean, it was an, a friendly, interesting, harmonious alliance between the British and the Americans. But now you have the sole thumb of the American Consulate General, the general sitting um, in the middle of the, uh, the, the, the the power base of the SAR government. So um, I think the, the, the US government did play a part at various points in time to um, direct the future of Hong Kong. Um, in today's environment, I find it uh, peculiar, to say the least, when I see some protesters waving a flag appealing to Donald Trump, my <laughs> lovely president, uh, for help in the case of Hong Kong. And uh, personally, I don't find that advisable. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Uh, prediction. Oh, uh, prediction. Um, sorry, yes. Uh, prediction. I, I was certainly very encouraged uh, by the election results of Sunday. Um, and regardless of what I said, of the, 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 the caveats that I, I gave you about the 40% that actually did vote, uh, in the other camp. This is the first time we see, this is basically a referendum. This is a vote of no confidence in Carrie Lam's government and the regime, right? Uh, in a way that we have not seen for a long time, if ever, because our, our election system, our voting system, does not allow you to voice yourself in such a way. And in that situation, you are always guessing. You think that you're in a majority. Now, is it, is it special to Hong Kong? No, I thought I was in a majority um, a few years ago in my uh, own presidential election south of here. I was proven wrong. So uh, most people I talked to on the ground, uh, whether they are yellow or blue, thought that they were solidly in the majority and they were going to win, whichever camp it was. Mm -hmm. And to see such overwhelming results, mm -hmm. at least in the number of seats mm -hmm. uh, going yellow, uh, was a wake up call, I hope. Mm -hmm. And I hope for the sake of the city I love that well, you don't have democracy um, in terms of universal suffrage, but then hopefully in spirit, we can acknowledge other people's voices and understand that the majority has spoken and we need to do something. 
Now, does it percolate up to um, the government level or even British or, or the uh, Beijing uh, regime? I doubt it because they have been uh, just as resilient as ever. But hopefully that would help resolve some of the um, fractures in Hong Kong. And hopefully that would allow us to at least initiate a dialogue that can help us reach across the divide. And uh, so I, th I guess the, uh, the, my prediction is uh, I'm just hopeful, but I may be hoping against hope based on uh, what we have seen in the last few years. And, 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 the, and the hopeful aspect is actually once you create more of a stable base um, in, in terms of uh, people's articulation of their, of their desires and interests, maybe we can be more realistic mm -hmm. in how we can engage not just with the uh, administration in Hong Kong, but in the regime in Beijing. Thank you, John. Uh, with that, I think we should draw it to a close. We have been asking you to do a lot already. Um, we continue to remain hopeful. I think that's, that's, that's important. Um, so thank you for coming to share with us, to share with us your, your insights and your thoughts. Uh, we like to hear um, people from Hong Kong um, because we do need to be, much as we get our information from social media, TV, that is always useful to have someone who, who are there to come and share with us. So thank you. And of course, thank you for... for your attendance, um, your continued support for our program, and so please join us uh, when you have time and if you can, um, we'll continue to go along. So thank you.